Uh, good evening. I would like just to dedicate this shiur for the good health of the Gveret Sonia Biton, whose name is uh, Sulika Shulamit Bat Hanina. May Hashem give her a Shlema. Bizchut Torah. Also to Bela Aminov, Refuash Lema Yeratso. Also, Sara Banu Batrena. Sara Banu Banu Batrena. Batrena. Refuash Lema. And also Leilu Nishmat. Sara Masha. Sara Masha. But uh, Allah. But Allah. Rabbi Meir. But Rabbi Meir. Leilu Nishmata. That's it. It is definitely my intention it is my intention to convey my good wishes and blessings to the organization uh, Torah anytime and I wish that Torah anytime will grow further from strength to strength it is definitely a great mitzvah to help it because spreading the Torah everywhere, the reward for that is incalculable. So this, therefore, to give a hand to this uh, organization, Torah Anytime, which is spreading Torah lectures everywhere, is definitely considered a mitzvah. And a great mitzvah for which we could say what the Talmud says in Masechet Pe'ah, the Talmud Torah keneget kulam which means there is, not, there is no equivalent to the mitzvah of Limuda Torah from any mitzvah. The learning Torah is the highest level of mitzvah that one can ever, uh, can ever do. And now we will we'll go to the second part of that lecture which we started a few weeks ago before Purim. Or before Pesach, we spoke about Kibud Avvaim, the mitzvah of honoring one's father and mother. See, Faina, your father is here, so he should know tonight how important it is to honor one's father. And we have discussed in that past lecture the importance of. Uh, this great commandment that appears as the fifth commandment in the, ten, in the list of the Ten Commandments. It comes immediately after the commandment of Zachor et Yom HaShabbat Lekadeshor. Remember Shabbat to sanctify it. Immediately after, the commandment of Kabed et Avicha ve'et Imecha lema'an ya'arichun ya'mecha. You have to honor your father and mother so that you will have a long life where Allah Adama upon the land that Hashem has given us which is which means in this world which is also explained in the Talmud in Masechet Chulin I think it's on page 110 Kufyud where we find that in fact the reward for the mitzvah of honoring one's parents is uh, giving us long life, which means eternal life in the world to come. But according to a great commentator who lived in Morocco 400 years ago, one of the greatest commentators of the Torah, very famous by, his name, by the name of his book, Or HaChayim HaKadosh, and whose name is Rabenu Chaim ben, Rabbi Chaim Ben Attar, he says in fact that Kabbalistically, to honor one's parents, does not only give you as a reward eternal life in the heavens, but it will also extend your life in this world. So it is, in fact, he says, Ora Chaim HaKadosh says, it is Sgula La Arichut Yamin, which means when you do this mitzvah properly, as we have already explained last time, and as we will pursue now the subject in explaining further 
the obligations of honoring one's parents and that if one does it with perfection then it is possible that his life will be extended longer of course you have to understand that there are always exceptions in this world if the Torah says and if it means that long life is given to somebody who honors his parents that does not mean that in every case you are going to see that because there were many cases many people who observed the mitzvah of honoring their parents in, in total perfection and yet they did not have the mazal to have a long life so that does not mean that it is a contradiction to what the Torah is saying or it does not mean that one should chas shalom God forbid, disobey the Torah saying, eh, you see the Torah is wrong. No. The ways of God are always mysterious. We have to accept them the way they come. And only we have to know that the power of this mitzvah does extend life. If it did not in many cases, or in some cases, it's because of other reasons. Which means it's very possible that a person could have a short life, very short life. Let's say it's written in heavens in, in his book that he should die after the age of 20. And because he gave tremendous honor to his parents, he succeeded to, to live till the age of 40. So now you understand that in this case, what happened? People are going to say that, what kind of mitzvah is this? Where is the promise that honoring one's, pa one's parents extends your life when this guy died at the age of 40? And they don't realize that in fact he was given 20 years more because of this mitzvah. Do you understand what I just said? The, the, that, that's how you should always see those that... I mean those kinds of exceptions that we find in the world when it, is in, when it stands in contradiction with what the Torah says. That somehow you must keep your belief very firm and explain that if he did not really uh, do, if he did not do this kind of mitzvah properly, probably he would have died much younger. So in a way he was given longer life. In fact, I'll come to you Mishael in a minute. In fact, we find a similar story in the Talmud. In the Talmud, we find that uh, the two great, most famous rabbis that we have in the Talmud, Abaye and Rava, from the fourth generation of the sages of the Gemara, of the Talmud, the Amoraim. Abaye and, and Rava were the geniuses of the Jewish people. There is not one page in the Talmud that we don't have to go through their tremendous mind and study them. And yet, Abaye was 60 years old when he died, and Rava, the, the, the extraordinary genius, much even greater than Abaye, died at the age of 40. So the Talmud tells us what's ha what happened there. Now this story does not have much to do with the commandment of honoring one's parents. But it has to do with what I explained before, that sometimes when you see something that seems to be a contradiction to what the Torah says, you have to calculate that probably he was given longer life despite the fact that he died young in the eyes of people. In which case... Oh boy. It's not you. <laughs> In the Talmud, they told us that those two great people who lived approximately 1800 years ago, Abaye and Rava, those two people, they came from a, the very ancient house of Eli. I don't know if you recall who is the prophet Eli, not Eli, not Eliyahu. This one is Eli. He was in the time of when Shemuel, when the prophet Shemuel, the greatest prophet, who is the one who anointed the King Shaul and later and King David. So Shmuel, when he was only 15 years old, he was learning in the house of Eli. 
Kohen. The prophet Ali. Prophet he was Kohen. the yeah he was but he was known as the foremost prophet of the Jewish people. But he was a Kohen. You're right. So if you know the scriptures a little bit the what it says in the Tanakh, then you know that the house of Ali was cursed. There are many stories about this, but that's not the issue. He wanted to... Uh, the, the child Shmuel was growing there when there was a very big confrontation. But anyway, the house of Ali became... Uh, a, a, was cursed. And what kind of curse? That anyone, any progeny, any descendancy from the house of Ali, forever and ever, even 3,000 years later, if he comes, if he could trace back that family to the house of, Levi, of Ali, then you should know that all the descendants have died very young. From the house of Ali came the two great geniuses, Abaye and Rava. And yet what does the Talmud tell us? That Abaye died at the age of 60. And Rava died at the age of 40. So the question is, if both of them came from the accursed house of Ali, they were supposed to die uh, almost the same age, right? And if 40, uh, the Rava died the, the, at the age of 40, Abaye should die also the same, approximately the, at the age of 40. So how come there is a 20 years of difference? So the Talmud tells us that even Abaye was going to die 20, yeah, I mean uh, 40 years old. But he was given an extra 20 years because he occupied himself besides the, the, the intensive learning of Torah that he had. He also found time to occupy himself with uh, tzedakah, fachesed, charity and loving kindness. Extensively. Because Rava also had a lot of deeds of kindness. But since he was so much immersed in Torah, he did not give much of his time to uh, to charity and kindness and loving kindness but Abaye did and that extended his life in this world by another 20 years so you see that even though people might say but Abaye also 60 years of age that's very young but compared to his, to his history and where he came from he died quite long uh, I mean versus Rava who died at the age of 40 and by the way Rava although he died at the age of 40, he was able to give us a monumental uh, uh, quantity, a massive quantity of Torah. Is there a day that we study the Talmud without encountering the genius of Rava? Rava, the Rosh Hashiva. So here this, when, when the Torah tells us, Kabed et avicha vet imecha, honor your father and mother, so that your life will be longer. So first you have to remember that our sages meant when they, when they explained this pasuk, what kind of long life they said. Is there such a thing as long life in this world? I mean, even if you live to be 120. So everybody will say, wow, we had a long life. But that's not a long life really. The truth is that everything passes quickly. 120 could pass in a jiffy also. You know, let me tell you something about Adam. Adam Arishon, the first man who was created by God. He was supposed to live for 1,000 years. But he ended up living only 930. Everybody knows this story. I think we even mentioned it sometimes in the past. That when he saw in paradise, he saw in the chest, the treasury chest of God of the Neshamot, of the souls, so he saw a sparkling, a shining kind of soul. So he asked God, what? Who is the owner of this soul? His soul seems to be a diamond that is, has extraordinary value. So God says that's the soul of King David. So he said to him, this man, and, but he has no life. He has, in the book of life there is no there is no life for King David. He was to be only in heaven. That's all. Not in this world. So Adam says, it's a shame that a man like this, the world should lose the, uh, the presence of such a great man who could help so much 
the world, please God, give him some time, give him few years. God says impossible. That's the in his book of life he is meant to be only in heaven, not in the earth. So Adam kept on begging God and he says, You know what? I'll give him from my own life. I'll give him seventy years. God says, Okay, we are in business. If you are willing to give him seventy years, seventy years it is. And King David was born and he lived exactly seventy years. But our sages said that Adam, who lived 930 years when he reached the age of 930 and he has to die now, right? God says this is a time. No, 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 please give me back my 70 years, he said. And then in the words of King Solomon, he said, wow, you could live eternally in this world and yet this passes in a second. It does not matter whether you live uh, 50 or 100, it's all the same. So it's not really considered in the terms of the Torah. When the Torah says long life, it cannot mean a hundred years. It cannot mean a hundred and fifty. Because in the eyes of the Torah, long means always, eternal. So therefore our sages explained that the Torah means here what is to have long life. If you honor your parents, you will have eternal life. Because life in heaven is indeed long. What do you mean long? Which means that never, never comes to an end. And that was his promise really. However, as I said before, the sages, the commentators do explain that nevertheless there is a segula of arichut yamim, of there is an extension of life somehow in this world. For some it could be 120, for some it could be 50, and yet it is considered long life because he was supposed to be uh, much less than that, and so forth. You understand? So in a way, both of them serve. Now the reward of long life for honoring one's parents uh, involves both life in heaven and life in this world. So definitely that <coughs> makes it uh, worthwhile. Now we have to discuss all kinds of particularities regarding this great mitzvah. You see the point of, and I think we have mentioned this uh, point last time, why is it that this commandment of honoring one's parents is written immediately after the... I mean, why does it come after the, four, the first four uh, uh, commandments? You know, the first commandment is, I am God, right? The second, you shouldn't have any other gods but me. The third is, uh, do not bear uh, the name of God in vain. And then, Zachor Yitom HaShabbat LeKadesho, remember the Sabbath to fulfill it properly and observe it. And then, the fifth commandment is, Kabedet Avi Chavet Imecha. Why does it appear after the fourth one? I mean, fourth, four commandments. It's because the first, the first four commandments that we have mentioned now deal with the honor of God. When you honor Him, you are not going to have another God. If you honor Him, you are not going to use His name in vain. If you, honor, if you honor God, you are going to also honor His special day, which is Shabbat. So the first four commandments are, are dealing with the honor of God. And now comes the honor of men, of the father and mother. You see, we have two fathers. The first father is Avinu Sheba Shamay, our father in heaven. But then we have a second kind of father, Hamolid, in our Jewish philosophy books. The one who gives, you, who gives birth to you. That's the human father. And God is interested that as much as you give honor to him, you have to give honor to your father and of course your mother, who are both considered to be partners of God. As the Talmud in Masechet Kiddushin on page 30, it says there, there are three partners in the making of man, as we have mentioned before. And who are they? The partners of God. We have three partners in the making of man. We have the father, the human father, who provides the white substance of the body, the skin, the brain and the bones. 
and the mother provides the flesh and the red substance of the body, the blood. So that means that the body is made of the father and the mother. And then the third partner, of course, is God who gives the soul. So you see that the father and mother are considered to be partners with God. And imagine, if you understand this to its proper depth, you will definitely come to the conclusion that you have to honor, we have to honor our parents in a way that is extraordinary. In other words, there is no limit. <coughs> you have to go to all means to honor your parents. Nevertheless. It says in Talmud Yerushalmi Masechet Pe'ah, Gadol ha-ne'emar be'aviv yoter me'ane'emar ba'kadosh baruchu. And yet, our sages say in Talmud Yerushalmi, that even though the father and the mother are considered to be partners to God, yet, what was said about the father and the mother is even more demanding than whatever was said about God. Let's explain. What does it say about God as far as honoring Him? There is a pasuk in the book of Mishle, the book of Proverbs, and where it says, Kabed et Hashem mehonecha. You have to honor God with your possessions. Hon. Hon in Hebrew means riches. If Hashem made you rich, you have to provide a lot of things that are in honor of God, such as use your money to beautify a synagogue. Use your money to buy a beautiful car to a Talmud Chacham. That's how we honor Hashem. So that means that only if you have the possibility, right? Since it says, Kabed et Hashem mehonecha, from the riches that He gave you, then that means, depending, if you have riches, if you have means by which to honor Him, then God demands honor. But if you have no money, then according to your ability. God does not insist so much on His honor, only in accordance with what He gave us. But the father and mother is something else. The Torah says in a dry manner, Kabedet avi chabet imecha. You have to honor your father and mother without any conditions. Upon which the Rambam is posek that chayav afilu ani hamechazer ala ptachim. Even a poor man who has to beg from door to door, he is under the strict obligation to sustain his father and mother if they need him. To provide for them. To honor them. Even if he is a poor man who has to beg for his own livelihood. And you know, one of a very ancient rabbi by the name Rabbeinu Bachya, a Sephardic rabbi, he lived approximately 800 years ago. There, was, there were two rabbis, Rabbeinu Bachya. And he wrote a book, Kad HaKemach. And he writes there, why is it that the Torah gave us this kind of reward of long life when you observe the mitzvah of honoring one's parents? What is the... Uh, in which way do we find here a midah keneged midah? A measure against measure. I mean, is the reward compatible with the commandment or not? In which way do we see a connection? So he says, listen, why is it that God gives you long life when you respect and honor your parents? So that you can live with them. And, you know, they might, be, they might have a long life. Your father and mother, they might get very old. And what happens when they are very old? And not so healthy. And not so stable. And they are in your house. Okay, you took care of them as long as you enjoy them. But what happens when the time comes that you don't enjoy them? On the contrary, you have hardship. Because the father is very old, the mother is very old, Alzheimer, this, this, this. And that. What do you do when you lose that kind of enjoyment and now all you have is strictly the commandment that is imposed upon you? So, therefore he says, that's why you get also long life because you have done well even with the long life of your parents. You knew how to contend with it. 
you did not regret, you kept on doing whatever is your obligations towards them, despite all the limitations and despite all the troubles that you get from them. You did not complain, you did not regret, you did not uh, uh, send them to a house of the, of the elders when they don't want, and you, you did not reject them, and you stayed with them with the proper covenant and everything, then you will definitely get also long life. And that's why Rashi, on the spot in the, the Torah says, Im techabed ya'arichun. Im love, it cuts through. See, if you respect your parents, your life will be longer. But chas shalom, God forbid, if you don't, then there is a rule in the Talmud that says, Michlal hen atashomea lav. When the Torah tells you something positive, you should also derive from that what is the negative. If the Torah tells you that it will, that God will give you longer life when you honor your parents, it means if you are very rude at your parents, you might even be given shorter life. That's the that's the the midah can get midah. Also, kavod means to carry, right? Kavod. Kavod means load. Load. Yes. So kavod means it's 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 uh, not easy to honor your mother and father. That's why it's. Uh, okay, I, I I of course I agree with Rabbi that. Rabbi Chaim was saying. That. Very nice. So it is true that kavod comes from the from the from the adjective kavod. Okay. Kavod kavod means heavy. So, which means that even when it is heavy, you have to continue. You don't give up. You know, people think that they honor their parents when their parents are sustaining them, providing them with money, providing them with good time, with everything. Always the parents are there to invite the children. Always they eat by them Shabbat today. It's a big problem. I told once to my wife, I hope my wife does not listen, but I, I told her, because we always inv invite my son and his children and of course that's that's life that's good but you see I told her once we were discussing I said I don't know if we are doing well I don't know if it is the proper thing to do to always invite I mean the first night of Pesach they are with us the second night they are by the in-laws the second part of Pesach again they are with us and the, and the second day they go to the in-laws when are they going to provide for themselves when are they going to learn how to also prepare for others when are they going to learn that life is not that easy perhaps we are doing the wrong thing this is what I told my wife well apparently thank God at least we are sure that our children are learning Torah so they don't forget the idea of what is, what, is, what is an obligation, despite the fact that they don't have the opportunity to exercise their obligation to the maximum. But it's a very... I allow myself to say this as an observation that, is, that requires a lot of thinking. Perhaps it's not so good to give too much to the children. Perhaps it's not so good because they get used to it, and then when the time comes that you cannot give that no more, for them it will be a terrible friction to their mentality, and they might, who knows, they, it might uh, express itself in something negative. I prefer not to, not to give the proper definition to what I am saying, but I am sure that you understand. Sometimes, it's not, by, by the way, never give very, very expensive gifts to your children. By giving them, you know, when I give her a doll, that's, uh, right? Today you could buy a doll for $500. You know, almost a robot. Why? By doing this, you are practically destroying so much in her system, in the little child's system. Give her a $2 doll, she will be happy as much, and then she will not grow to be Baal Gava with arrogance. One day, if you gave a $500 gift, then if you give, a, if the next time you give less, you are now in the deficit, which means you are regarded as someone who is not worthy of honor. And that's not the way to teach our children. To teach our children the proper honor is while helping them to also make sure that they learn to provide themselves for others. You see, when we came to America, I came with my wife to America. We just got married and immediately two weeks later we came to America. We were invited by the Queen's community and then from one year to every year. <laughs> 
But I remember when I came, we, we, we always had to prepare for guests. We had to bring guests. We were never, almost never, uh, given the opportunity that somebody else is taking care of us. Only God took care of us and that's it. But you know what happened? Because of that we became very good machnise orchim. Very good uh, 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 hosts to people. I mean, we, we invite people and we are, we are happy to see uh, people to come to visit us and so forth. So the mitzvah, our sage says, Gedolach nasat orchim yoter mi kabalat pneshchina. The mitzvah of uh, welcoming a guest and taking care, taking care of him is even greater than uh, welcoming the divine presence. So, Baruch Hashem, that's why, because we had no other choice. Nobody else, I mean, my family is in Israel, we were here all alone, so we had to provide, if we wanted to have a nice seder, we had to bring many people to our house. So my wife always worked for others, for, for guests. And anyway, we don't want to go anywhere on Pesach. We want to stick to our house. But in the meantime, we have, Baruch Hashem, developed the mitzvah of Hachnasat Orchim, as well as other things. But a person who is always used to be invited, such as the children, one has to give some kind of thinking to this. Perhaps it's not so good to exaggerate. It's good to invite once in a while, but not always. Well, I don't know if, uh, if I agree with what I am saying, but at least in principle and philosophically talking, there's no question about it that people have to be careful with not to invite too much when it means that the others are not getting used to, to fulfill the mitzvah of doing, the, doing it themselves for others. Do you agree with me in that or not? Perhaps not. Because the generation is totally different today. Today, you know who's the boss today? The children. But that's not the, 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 the thing to be. That's not the, the, the real thing. That's not the proper thing. I tell you the truth. The mitzvah, the Torah tells us three times in the whole Torah, three times a repetition of the same commandment. Not even once the Torah tells us about honor your children. It doesn't say. And yet today, what do we see? The parents who honor their children, and that when it comes to the, to the children to honor their parents, that's already a different question. Depending what kind of a house. Today, you don't see that much. You see usually children who are rebellious and causing a lot, a lot, a lot of tsar, a lot of heartache to their parents. When they don't realize that every second of heartache that they cause their parents is a catastrophe for themselves. There is no worse thing to do than to, be, to dishonor one's parents. The parents are here to be respected without any limitations. Mamash. I'm right, like God himself. Because they are partners, they brought you to the world. Of course, there is also the, the honor that we owe to the Rav. The Rabbi who teaches you Torah. I'm talking about the Rabbi who teaches you every day. Not once a week. But every day. If you learn Torah from a Rabbi every day, then you have to you owe him honor, no end. Sometimes more than you can. Sometimes you are so right, Malkiel, by saying sometimes. Because the, the Rambam is posek, Aveda, the Gemara, this is a Gemara in Masayat Kiddushin, and the Rambam is posek that Aveda, Trabova, Aveda, Aviv, Makodem. If, for example, both your father and your Rebbe, from whom you learn Torah, both of them lost something at the same time. And they charge you to go and look for it. Who are you going to look for first? Are you going to look for your father's possession that he lost? Or your Rebbe's position, uh, possession that he lost? Which one do you prefer? So the, 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 Ramb the Rambam is posek, as the Talmud says, that one has to go first to look for that possession of the rabbi who lost his possession. And then later the father. Why is that? Because the father brought you to this world. But the, te the Torah teacher brings you to the other world. The other world is much longer. 
much greater and therefore he deserves the honor even more than the father. But the reason I said that you were right, Malkiel, by saying only sometimes, it's because that is what I said is true only when the father neglects the education of his son. When he does not pay for his tuition, for example, and uh, he goes to yeshiva for free, then his rebbe comes first. The rabbi who teaches Torah is first. But if the father pays and goes to extremes, to pay for the Torah education of his son, then automatically his father becomes not only his father that brought him to this world, but he's also the same father who brings him to the world to come. He becomes like his own Rebbe, which means if the father pays for your tuition in the yeshiva, he becomes also your first Rebbe. He is also your Rav. So that's a little detail as in this subject that we dedicate, of course, only to the subject of kibud avvaen, honoring one's parents. As Rabbi Sa'ad Yagaon himself also said, almost what we said already before, why necessarily that the reward is long life? He says because sometimes the, the parents do have a long life and you have to stay with them all that long. And sometimes they become a lot, they become a big uh, responsibility. So that's when the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination starts working on us. And, and so that, that's why, that's where the challenge begins. That's when the test begins. If you withstand the test, despite the difficulties, you will have long life in this world and the world to come. Another famous uh, commentator by the name Rabbi Yitzchak Karo, not Rabbi Yosef Karo Maran, but Rabbi Yitzchak Karo says, he asks the question, usually when, when the Torah gives us a reward for some mitzvah that you do, it has to be it has to be connected, as we said before. It has to have a connection. Measure against measure. Something that fits the deed. So he asks, in which way the reward of long life fits the mitzvah, the good deed of honoring one's parents? So he explains, here it is. You know what happens? If you honor your, your parents, you will get a long life. Usually, what do we do with old people? We honor them. They're always, you know, you go to, he goes to the bus, somebody always will get up for him. Because that's a natural instinct of people, to honor the aged, to honor elderly. Right? So he says, as realistically as possible, of course, in this commentary of Rabbi Yitzchak Karo, that if you, if you honor your parents, you will get also long life, and automatically they will give you also honor. You will be honored because you will be old also. You understand? So automatically the reward that the Torah mentions of long life is, in, is exactly adequate to the deed of honoring one's parents. So you see that long life means that you are given also honors and respect. And here we have to talk a little about what is the status of a person who does not. You know, like we see today, chutzpah. Our sages say in the Gemara that before the Mashiach comes, the generation will be chutzpanik. There will be a lot of chutzpah, a lot of insolence, rudeness, violent rudeness. It's very difficult today to uh, exercise any power over children, especially the teenager. Very difficult to... I, I, I know even many friends of mine, even big rabbis, who had so many troubles with their children, it's unbelievable. It's a big problem. Where does it start from? You know, if people are educated from the very beginning to honor their parents, 50% of their life will be easier. The parents and the children. But most of the problems that we incur in this life, in this world, is because there was no proper education 
there was no proper preparation of the child to respect properly his parents. However, if you turn back the clock to about 50 years ago, that's all. Was there any house in which you didn't see a child who behaved like a servant to his father and mother? Children were extremely obedient. Today is the generation when children are rebellious. And that's a sign that the Mashiach is coming. Well, I did explain once that the one, could be that one of the reasons is that because in the air there is such rebellion of the young against their own parents, maybe when the Mashiach comes, this rebellion will turn to be positive. And they will work with their imposing upon their parents to be more religious. Did you think about this? Which means the fact that today we see that there is a rebellion of the young people against their elderly parents could serve us better. I'm not, of course, I'm not advising that this is what should be. I'm just saying that why it is a sign that the Mashiach is coming. Because when the Mashiach is coming, everybody has to do tshuva. And sometimes, you know, it's very difficult to change a person. But if his son is already religious, it will be already halfway towards uh, helping his father to become also religious. But how would the father listen to his son if his son is subdued to him? Usually he would not even listen to his son. But if the son was rebellious all the time and imposing and the father is afraid of his son, might be a good beginning that he will listen to him to become... Uh, but anyway, forget about what I said. Uh, this uh, is neither here nor there. Uh, but the same thing happened to Abraham, no? Uh, his father didn't was on the right path. But, uh, but what, Ishmael? No, um, Terah. Oh, Terah, no. He didn't listen to him, then he didn't have the... You are asking a very beautiful question. He's saying this. Abraham, he cannot be more perfect than our father Abraham. He is the paroxysm of perfection. He found himself the presence of God. But his father was an idol worshipper. We discussed this in the past. How did he get to be a Baal Shuva? I mean, how did he come to be so perfect when his father was? Let me first tell you a few secrets. Secret number one. Don't belittle so much his father. Terach was an idol worshipper. But there is a very big difference between idol worshipping and character. Idol worshipping is one case by itself that we have discussed in one lecture. But that doesn't mean that Terach was a bad man. That doesn't mean that he did not educate properly his child. I'm sure that he gave to Abraham all the ingredients with which he grew by himself, knowing that to be a mensch is to be a person of integrity. The integrity that Abraham had, I'm sure it came from his father. Only his father's religion was different. Now, let me give you the second secret. Our sages say in the Talmud, asa One day, you know what happened to Abraham? God appeared to him. God says to Abraham, Yalla, get out. Leave your father, the house of your father and mother. Leave the house, the, the, your, your city and leave your country to a place where I will show you. And Abraham took his little few possessions and he left. It's not easy to leave uh, your house your father's house, your family, your friends, your society, your civilization. It's not. But this was the commandment of God. He followed. And then the Abraham's uh, vocation was, is known to everybody. He became the father of the universe, of the, of the world. Of Hamon Goim. Later on, towards the, the coming death of his father, our sages said that his father also became a religious man, which means he followed in the footsteps of his son. 
So you see what happens? Usually we don't say you follow in the footsteps of your son. I mean, children follow in the footsteps of their parents. But here we see that, in fact, Terach followed in the footsteps of his son, Abraham. And that's a marvelous thing. But we don't mention this too much because Terach does not mean too much for us. You see, and Abraham, in which way was he special? In the fact that he was the beginning. When, it is, when, when we are talking about the person who is the beginning, we don't look for before. We don't ask who was before, what happened before. He is the beginning. So why should I care about his father when Abraham means the beginning for all of us? You understand? Think about it. When a person does not... What is the real kavod of your parents? You know, the real honor... I'm going to tell you something that might be considered revolutionary. But the real honor that one honors his parents is when he is an observant Jew. Apparently, what I'm saying, what is this? Again, the real honor that a person can give to his parents is when you are an observant Jew. When you are not an observant Jew, we are going to discuss several issues that will show us that if you don't keep the Torah and the mitzvot, the honor that you might be giving to your parents is not considered honor. Because the real honor, again, is not here. It's there. Let me explain myself. Let's assume that you are a good father, a good man and everything. And you didn't have the mazal to have a good son. And the son goes out the house. He's a big sinner. And he does many shameful things. So now let's say this boy, he comes home. He says, hi daddy. How are you? Are you okay? Can I bring you a, cas a, a cup of water? Can I make you comfortable? Very nice. But the guy outside, the son outside is a wreck. He's a reckless guy. He does whatever he wants. Does he honor his father? He does not honor his father. Because he shames his father. The real honor of a person is only when people say, look at this boy. What a great boy is this. You know? Look at him. The way he behaves. The way he, he deals in his business. His integrity and everything. And he is a religious man. So automatically everybody is going to praise first the father and the mother. They are going to say, you know, he's the son of this fellow. Wow, so great. That's the real honor. When the father and mother are proud of their children because of what people say about their children. If you have a son who is a great Talmud Chacham, who is famous in his reputation as a scholar and everything, most of this honor is taken by the parents. Now that is in this world. What about the world to come? In the world to come, the honor is only from the observance of Torah and mitzvot. If the son did not do any mitzvot, then even if the father and mother were religious, they are going to be ashamed. So is this honor? So therefore, the real honor that one can give his parents is first by becoming a good religious man. When you are not religious, that's not... Even though you might be a nice character who honors his parent, but that's not real honor. Yes, man. The, the, the sages bring down that uh, Yaakov and Esau, two brothers, identical, Esau honored his father more than anybody. There is nobody that comes to any tzaddik right now, nobody comes to the equivalents the way Esau honored his father. At the same time, we learn that Esau was rebellious and, and outside, and he would do a lot of sin. He was a sinner. Not to only his, that. He was, to his father, he was... Uh, like extraordinary special that is true father. not only that Yaakov was scared from Esau right. despite the fact that God extended to him his special protection and yet he was scared of Esau why? because he knew that Esau honored his parents more than him right. of course that doesn't mean that it was voluntarily Yaakov did not honor his parents as much as Esau because he, he was 
by the command of his mother, he left them for 21 years. He was away from them, so he didn't have the opportunity to serve them. You know? And, uh, but Esav stayed with his parents, and he honored them to the maximum. And yet our sages, they say, when they vent the tremendous uh, mitzvah of Esav as a person who honored his parents, they always add the, the adjective harasha. Esav harasha, the wicked Esav. Which means, tells us that despite the fact that he honored uh, to the maximum his parents, he was still a rasha. So this in fact, in fact confirms what I said before. That the real honor, for example, in heaven, in heaven, who's the father of Esav? Yitzchak, right? Uh, uh, and he is the father of Yaakov. So if, es, if, if Yitzchak is given all the biggest honors in paradise, because of whom is he is going to be? Because of Esav? I mean, Yitzchak still cries till today that he has a son like Esav. Abraham cries forever because he has a son like Ishmael. That's, that's the reason why we say Kaddish, because the children bring the parents to Ganesha. That's right. Well, exactly, Malkiel. If just by saying Kaddish, you are elevating the memory and the level of your father and mother in heaven, how much more if every day of your life is a life of Torah, a life of mitzvot, when you go home, when you go home and you, you want to eat, you wash your hands, you do the motzi, you eat with kavana, not like a wild person, after you finish, you recite Birkat Amazon. All this is written, not only to your credit, but also to the credit of the parents in heaven. So that's the real honor. So if a person does not observe the Torah at all, then he does not honor his, uh, his parents. In fact, I have to share with you another insight in this vein. The Talmud tells us in Masechet Shabbat that there was a big, in ancient times, in the time of Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai, that's over 2,000 and so years ago, there was a very big quarrel, a very big dispute of opinions, machloket. About what? Noach lo la'adam shenivra? Or lo noach lo la'adam shenivra? Is it beneficial for a person to have been born? Or perhaps it would have been more beneficial to him if he was not born? That was the question that was in question. An argument upon which many years this was a big argument. Is it worth it? In other words, we could put it in a different way. Is it worth it to be born or not? So, there was a big machloket between Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel. One says, yeah, it's worth it to come to this world. The other one says, no, it's not worth it. Preferable to stay there. If you stay there, at least you have what you have there. But you come here, you might spoil what you have, and then you get nothing. On the other hand, the guy who comes here, maybe he'll get much more than what he had before, and he will go back having an empire in his hand. So, what are we going to decide? What is the decision? And the Talmud tells us, Nimnu vegamru. They came to the resolution that no wachlol adam shelo nivra. It's better not to be born. Aval achshav she nivra. But now that he is born, well, now that he is born, ye fashpesh be maasav. It's not good to be born. But now you're born anyway. Nobody is asking us whether you have you, you are born or not. Like it says in Pirkei Avot. We might be giving you a few lectures on Pirkei Avot uh, in the following weeks. One of them will be this one. It says in the Pirkei Avot, "Be'al korchacha ata chay, u'be'al korchacha ata met, u'be'al korchacha ata nolad, u'be'al korchacha ata atid litendin v'cheshbon l'fnei." By force you were born. By force you live. By force you will die. And by force you will have to give the account before the Almighty God. You understand? So nobody is asking us whether we want to come to this world or not. By force, that if God decides you have to go, you have to go. There's a Talmud in, in Masechet Nida on page 30, where it says that the Neshama is begging God, please don't send me to this world. I don't want to be born. And God says you have to go because that's your destiny. 
At the same time, it's a great privilege to be born in this world. The Zohar Kadosh says it's a great privilege because Nahmadik is Sufa. If you stay there, you are eating from something that you did not deserve. But you come here, at least you are going to, to do the best you can to earn your bread. Otherwise, bread that you eat for free is called bread of shame. That's what the Zohar Kadosh says. So now, the Talmud came to the conclusion that it's not worth it to be born. But now that you are born, nobody has, uh, has asked us our opinion whether we want to be born or not. God says, you be born, we are born. So at least do the best you can. So I will say just now, you do the best you can. So now, the best you can means that you have to do the mitzvot and the Torah. Right? You have to keep the Torah. But, if let's say you, if you love your parents, and you honor them, to the maximum, in sweet talk, in not, never to be rude to your parents. Be careful, Rabotai, not to be rude to the parents. You are rude to the parents, you are rude against God. God will not pay attention to all the good deeds that you do. If you are rude, Hasve Shalom, God forbid, to the parents. And I'm saying this not to you only, to myself and to everybody. We made a lot of mistakes. Sometimes when somebody wakes up only after his parents are dead and then they are no more there to be able to rectify his mistakes. So that therefore one should, should do the best he can. Remember Rabbi Tarfon? I told you about Rabbi Tarfon, the famous rabbi who was... Every morning he would come to the bed of his mother and the mother would wake up and since the floor is cold and there was no carpet then, so... He would put his hands and go like this. Hop, hop, and she steps on them. That's how she walks to the bathroom. I'm not going to go back again to those stories because we already mentioned them last time. So you see how, what is the meaning of honoring one's parents? But at least, but I, what I'm saying, at least because this is the sin of the generation. Rudeness. To be rude. As soon as a person is depressed, he feels free to insult his parents. He feels free to, to close the phone rudely on his mother, on his father. And they don't realize that what they are doing in a single gesture like this, in a gesticulation, one small gesticulation that is rude towards the parents, you lose empires. You lose so much. On the other hand, when you give proper honor to your parents and you give them pleasure and you, you make them happy, you have no idea how, how much of a winner you become. And this I am telling you from the bottom of my heart to the extreme depth of my mind. There is no greater truth than that. The parents should be honored no matter what. They brought you to this world. No matter whether they are rich or not, whether they are healthy or not, whether they are affluent or not, you must give them the proper respect that has no limit. Otherwise, if you don't, then Noach lo shelo nivra. What did we say before? That there was a big discussion. Is it worth it to come to this world or not? Depending. Since our sages said, now that you are here, do the best you can. It means, number one, you have to keep the mitzvah of honoring one's parents. If you honor your parents, it means you love it that they brought you to this world, right? What happens when you are very rude to the parents? You know, today, I heard in a certain lesson of psychology that children, the reason they are extremely violent, this, this generation, because they, they say that they are protesting. Why did you bring me to this world? They feel that the responsibility of their being in this world for everything that they suffer, they forget all the good things that they have. But now they have this, uh, this one hour of depression, immediately, why did you bring me to this world? So this gives them an excuse to lash at their parents. What a gross mistake it is that they are losing their life there and here with a mistake like this. But now, if you are very rude to your, disrespectful to your parents, 
It shows that you are not happy that you came to this world, right? No achlo shelo nivra. And he hates his father for, for bringing him to this world, and his mother, of course. But if you are honoring them, by honoring them, it's like if you are saying to them, thank you, Abba, Ima, that you brought me to this world. I am happy that I am in this world. Because I am... How else can you explain the fact that a, that a son is very happy with his, with his parents, that he, that he shows them honor and happiness? That means, it means only one thing. Thank you for bringing me to this world. Ah, if you are on that category of those who say thank you for coming to this world, then you have accomplished your mission either way. Then your mission in this world has been accomplished and now only gain in the world to come. Of course, if you believe in the world to come. But you see, today, this week, we start the, the first uh, portion of, uh, of Masechet Avot, of Pirke Avot, that begins with the words, Kol Israel Eshlaim Chelek Le'olam Abba. So that's the, 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 the biggest and the foremost emuna faith that we have, that Israel is going to have an eternal life in the heavens. But one has to be very careful not to spoil the portion that he has in heaven by being rude at his parents. I have so much more information to give you, but I know that the time is very short. Let me conclude with the following insight. There's much more to say, of course. There's no end to what we can say. I was planning tonight to discuss many laws, in particularity with uh, how, how, to which extent do we have to respect and honor. Who are, who, who, who are the beneficiaries of this respect and honor? Is it only the father and mother? Perhaps also the big brother? Perhaps also the wife of your father? Perhaps also the mother, I mean the, 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 the husband of your mother, you know, in case they... So, if you wish, we can always discuss it next week. But let me conclude with the following. The Zohar Kadosh says, When a son is Shomer Shabbat and Mitzvot, which is, by the way, the reason why it comes immediately after the commandment, of, uh, of observing Shabbat in the Ten Commandments. Why is it? Why is there such a proximity? What is the, the reason for this juxtaposition between the commandment of Shabbat and the commandment of honoring one's parents? As I said before, there's no question about it that it has to do a lot. Keeping Shabbat has to do a lot with the respect of one's parents. You know, if you don't keep Shabbat, automatically you don't respect your parents. Why? Your parents kept Shabbat. You don't continue with their tradition. You don't respect their way. By not keeping Shabbat, you don't respect their ways. By not keeping the mitzvot, you are not respecting the old ways of your parents. That's, number one, a great dishonor, a great disrespect towards your parents. So the real son is the son who, is, who keeps the mitzvot and does not bring a lot of sins upon his hands. And thus he will bring a lot of kavod and honor to his parents. We find in Midrash Rabbah, this is a conclusive thought that I would like to share with you. It says in Midrash Rabbah, if a person honors his parents properly, he will not be a sinner. He will not be a big sinner. You cannot be a sinner and at the same time you are a very, very, a person who respects his parents properly. Which means the Midrash says that if you respect your parents and properly, it will not be easy to sin. Where do we learn this from? We learn this from Yosef Hatzadik. Remember Yosef, Joseph, the son of Yaakov. When he was sold to Egypt, he was a servant of Potiphar, in the house of Potiphar. Yosef was a very handsome man. So handsome, you have no idea. Our sages said that when he was passing by, there were many servants in the house of Potiphar that peeled potatoes and cucumbers. When they saw Yosef passing, they kept on peeling, but they, they did not realize that they were peeling their own flesh. Because they were mesmerized with the beauty of Yosef. 
And they did not pay attention that instead of peeling the potato, they were peeling their hands. I said, the potatoes, this is my way, but there was no potatoes then. You know, potatoes were not then. But potatoes were discovered only in the last uh, thousand years. Some say by the Chinese, some say by Marco Polo. Not in America? I don't know. We'll go to, when we have a lecture about potatoes, <laughs> discuss it. So you well, it doesn't matter, but we know that, so, but cucumbers at least I'm sure they had, so they peeled cucumbers, so he was so handsome. That's why we say that Yosef didn't have Ainara, the evil eye. But you see, there is a problem when you are very handsome. Our sages said, when you are very handsome, your Yetzerara also is very big. Your uh, evil inclination is big. There's a story of a Nazir in the, in the, in the Masechet Nazir that we are studying these days. There was a young man who did not see his face on the mirror. One day he saw his reflection in the water and he saw that he was a very handsome man and he had long hair. He, had, he went and he became a Nazir. He cut his hair. When Rabbi Shimon ben Shattar, the great rabbi, saw him, he said, What happened to you? Why did you shave your head? So the, son, so the boy said, Rabbi, I saw myself. I saw, if I keep my hair, I'm going to, to be inviting the Yetzerara. I will be inviting the, the, the evil inclination. You know, that's the way. Therefore, let me take care at least of 50% of whatever the Yetzerara can be. He shaved his head this way. People, you know, girls will not be attracted to him so much. And the Yetzerara will not be so big. Anyway, you know, you understand what I mean. Yosef had the same problem. Because the Talmud tells us in Mashiach Shabbat, if for example, when we go to heaven, so many people are going to go there missing so much. So God is going to ask us, Hey, Malkiel, why didn't you learn Torah, for example? Well, not Malkiel, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Another Malkiel. Not even Malkiel, the other, the other Malkiel, no. And another Malki might say, how can you ask me to learn Torah? I was too busy bringing such, I was a, a poor man, he made me poor, and therefore I had to work very hard. So God will say to him, okay, I made you poor, but can you be poorer than uh, Hillel? Hillel was the poorest man, and yet he had to go and he struggled to learn Torah. Fine. And then another guy comes, and he, he did not learn Torah. And God says, why didn't you learn Torah? So he would say, what can I do, God? You're to blame. You made me so rich. I had no, I had no time. My business was everywhere and I had no time. He says, can you be richer than Rabbi Al-Azhar ben Kharsom? A very rich rabbi in the old time. Who practically left all his business to his servants and employees. And he kept learning Torah. There were many rich rabbis. And then finally the guy, the third guy comes to God. He also did not learn Torah. And then nicely, he looks like Elvis. Was Elvis... Uh... <laughs> nah, Elvis. Elvis is not so handsome. No? <laughs> Stuart. But anyway, the guy came, and he's with his hair well groomed and everything. And God says, hey, tell me, why didn't you learn Torah? And the man says... God, how can you ask me to learn Torah? I was surrounded with girls. You made me so handsome that there was no time. At the Yetzirah, my evil inclination was so big, it was impossible. So he said to him, so God will say to him, Oh yeah? Were you more handsome than Yosef? Than Joseph? And yet Joseph was a very, very great disciple of Torah. He learned Torah all his life. And yet he was very handsome. So now... This is a, just a little, a little thing into what I want to, uh, to tell you, the, the insight with which I will conclude. So Yosef, everybody knows the story. Tragedy happened, he was sold by his brothers, and now he ended up in Egypt. Where? In the house of Potiphar. Potiphar was all like the mayor of the place. So he learned to see that this boy, this man, is so perfect. Yosef was an honest man, a man of integrity. Little by little, he practically, Potiphar says, this, this man should be, I have to give him all my house in his hands. Let him govern my house. Because he's so honest and everything, and so smart. 
And Yosef became the guy in charge of the house of Potiphar. One day, and you know, there was there the wife of Potiphar. The wife of Potiphar was very beautiful. Very beautiful. I would say, just say, one of the most beautiful women on earth. Her name was Zuleikha. Why do I remember this? Somebody today, today somebody called me on the phone. Rabbi, tell me, what was the name of the wife of Potiphar? I said, what the heck are you, what do you do with <laughs> what do you want? And I, I remember, I said, Zuleikha. Zuleikha, that's a name brought in the Midrash. So Zuleikha was there. And she, our sages said that Potiphar was not a man and so forth. And he was not that. So she saw Yosef, she fell in love with Yosef. She tried all kinds of tricks with him, didn't work. Yosef all the time would even, not even look at her. One day, everybody went to the church, and the wife of Potiphar said, uh, listen, I am I, I'm sick today, I have to stay home. She stayed home, and now Yosef is in charge of the house, he's home, he doesn't go to church. And she said, that's, the day, that's my day, today I'm going to get him. And that's when everybody knows that she came and she, she practically jumped over him. The Torah tells us that Yosef, in a very quick way, Yosef practically left his uh, vest in her hands and ran away. And then she started, she fomented against him all kinds of uh, things, that he wanted me, came to me, and that's why he was thrown into jail, as you know the story in the Torah. But the, our sages have a, a larger version of the story of Potiphar and Yosef. In fact, Yosef also was a human being. A beautiful woman. All alone. Uh, what can you do? So, he almost did it. He almost. The last minute, our sages say, he practically planted his nails in the ground not to commit the sin but he almost was going to do it she almost got him all the way when suddenly our sages said ra'a khad amar ra'a yukno shel aviv khad amar ra'a yukna shel immo one opinion says that suddenly he saw a vision of his father and one says that he saw the vision of his mother. Uh -uh. He stopped. As he probably said to him, why, why my love, what happened? Get out of here, I don't... And that's how he left and that's how she became so angry at him and she even, uh, because of, of her uh, uh, story, they threw him in jail. Which was in fact the beginning of everything. But that's what saved him from the ultimate sin of going with the wife of another, his father. If he was a, the kind of boy who did not respect his father and mother, you think he would have had a vision like this? Because our sages say a vision, but you know, for us it means he remembered the face of his father. As soon as the face of his father came to his mind, and he said to himself, I'm, no, I don't want to see. My mother, will, my father will be ashamed. If I do it, my father will be ashamed. That stopped him. And then he rejected her. Whether it is his mother or father, we know from this that the parents, if you are a person who honor them, they will save you from sin. Because if Yosef did has ended up doing it, doing that, performing that sin, he wouldn't be for us, Yosef Hatzadik, no more. And, the re and we call him all the time Yosef Hatzadik, the righteous Yosef. Why? Because of this story. You know, he almost failed completely. There's another story in the Talmud of a person, but that's for another time. When the tzitzit, the, of, uh, the fringes of his talit saved him. So a mitzvah could save you from committing something. But here in this case, at least we know that having Revering one's parents could save you, mamash, and save you forever and save your soul. So, thank you very much for listening. There's much more to say. Perhaps we will, we will continue with this subject next time. Perhaps not. But in the meantime, this is what we have to say for tonight. <coughs>